Hello, everyone, and welcome to Planet IMAX. My name is Dan Noyce, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for today's very popular session, Contracts and Negotiations in a Post-COVID-19 World. Our presentation today will be around 25 minutes, and with that being said, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Dr. Tyra Warner. Thank you, Dan, and I'm really happy to be here and happy to be with the Planet IMAX audience uh, talking about contracts and negotiations in a post-COVID-19 world. Um, boy, have I heard a lot about this since COVID started. Call it, the phone has been ringing off the hook. So let's jump right in and talk about some of the uh, some of the contracts issues that I'm sure some of you have been facing um, in dealing with your contracts. But of course, I wouldn't be a lawyer worth my salt if I didn't start with my own disclaimer and some caveats. And that is that although we're going to talk about contracts and contract issues and possibly a little bit of contract language, this is for educational purposes only. Um, so I'm just providing education and information to you. Nothing here should be construed as legal advice. Um, so if you use any of the information that I've provided and it doesn't work for you, you can't sue me for legal malpractice. I am a lawyer, but I am not your lawyer. Uh, so anyway, have to get that out of the way right up front. All right, let's move on. Um, and let's talk a little more about what we're doing. So with regard to contracts during COVID, the key word we are looking for is flexibility. Um, you know, it seems like in this time of COVID with everything that's going on, more than anything, uh, both parties to any contract, all parties to any contract really need to be flexible because frankly, we just don't know what's around the corner. We don't know how long COVID's going to last. We don't know what it's going to look like. We don't know if it's getting worse, if it's getting better, uh, how it's going to affect our contracts, our meetings, our venues. Um, and so where usually as a lawyer, what I'm trying to say is button up the details, take out as much of the ambiguity from the contract as possible. That's a good contract. Um, now I'm saying, well, let's try to build in some flexibility. And that frankly goes a little bit against my grain, but that's really what's making the best contracts right now for both parties, um, simply because of the situation that we're in right now. So let's talk a little bit about some of the specifics. Um, you know, everybody's uh, asking me what's what's different now with COVID. What's different in, in contracts, and how are how are contracts changing? Um, and it's funny because sometimes we lawyers get together um, and we kind of say, you know, there's really not that much that's new in contracts. Uh, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, it, mostly, the law stays the same. It's just how you apply that law in a new context that changes. And so that's really the situation here. Now, with COVID, it has surprised us. There actually are a few specific, new specific things that you may want to look at adding to your contract that pertain specifically to COVID. Um, but a lot of it is the old language, indemnification, cancellation, force majeure, um, that has always been around. It's just now we're looking at it through a new lens. Um, in terms of COVID-19 and how that applies in that context. So we're going to talk about a little bit about that, um, about some COVID-specific terms you may want to look at in your contract, some of these old terms and how you want to look through that lens at them and make sure that they say and cover what you want to. Um, but I wanted to start with the concept of duty of care. And let me be really clear about this. Duty of care is not a clause you need to add to your contract, okay? In fact, it's, it's not a clause at all. Um, duty of care is a legal obligation, and it, it's not a new one. It doesn't, it's not something that came along and was invented with COVID-19. Duty of care is an obligation you have always had. You, whether you are the meeting planner, you, whether you are the venue or uh, the motor coach operator or the DMC or the audiovisual company or the production company or whoever you are, you have a duty of care um, to adhere to a standard of reasonable care while providing a facility or services um, that could reasonably, reasonably harm others or foreseeably harm others. And so basically what this means is, are you uh, and this is part of the test for liability is, did you have a duty of care to the people that you were serving or housing or whatever the situation is? 
did you breach that duty of care in providing your services or providing housing, whatever it is, did that breach cause the injury or harm? Uh, and that's sort of the question that a court would ask if somebody were injured or harmed in, in you operating your services uh, while they were there. And so, of course, this is the big scary monster that we're all looking at. What if somebody comes to my meeting and gets COVID? What if somebody stays in my hotel and gets COVID? Uh, what if it's one of my employees who comes to work, has COVID, and somebody gets it? And so this is what we're looking at a lot. Now, the main um, probably one of the main um, contract clauses that we're looking at that protects from some of this uh, is our indemnification clause. Um, and I'll show you something that works even better in just a minute. But indemnification is one of those things where, um, you know, I, I use this phrase, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever, bounce, whatever you say bounces off of me and sticks to you. Now, I don't know if this is a saying outside of the United States, but it's a very popular kids saying here in the U.S. Um, and I have a 10 year old son, so I know it's true. Um, but it, it's that's kind of how indemnification works. Indemnification basically says if you get in trouble because of something I did, then the liability is going to bounce off of you and stick to me or vice versa. Um, so the sort of the classic example is a meeting group meets in a ballroom of a hotel and the chandelier in the hotel falls from the ceiling, hits an attend a meeting attendee. The meeting attendee sues the group because they're like, hey, I was at your meeting. I got injured at your meeting and I'm going to sue you because that's what we do, especially here in the United States where we're uh, litigious. Um, the meeting attendee, the meeting organizer says, I don't have anything to do with hanging chandeliers. That liability bounces off the meeting organizer and sticks to the facility because there it was their chandelier. That's indemnification sort of in a nutshell. Um, so the idea is that with any kind of, of COVID claim, um, there might be something similar. Meeting attendee goes to a meeting in a hotel, gets COVID, believes they got it at at the hotel, they might sue the meeting organizer, but the idea is would the liability bounce off the meeting organizer and stick to the hotel if they believed they got it in the restaurant, if they got it in the bar, if they got it because the housekeeping didn't clean up to the cleaning standards that they thought they were going to versus that they got it at the meeting itself uh, during the reception, you know, that kind of thing. Now, these are all far-fetched, would need much more detailed fact patterns behind them because can you attend a meeting and sit that close to people and then say, oh no, I got it in the bar, not possibly at this meeting. Eh, kind of hard. Um, but that's the idea behind indemnification and why you'd want a strong indemnification clause in your contract. Interestingly, um, this is a sign, I live in Georgia, uh, and this is a sign that I have started seeing, and there's a smaller version of it that I've started seeing at a lot of restaurants and stores in our area. And this, re this sign is part of a law that was passed here in our state, and other states have passed similar laws. This is part of the Georgia COVID-19 Pandemic Business Safety Act. And as you can see, it says there's no liability for injury or death of an individual entering these premises if such injury or death results from the inherent risks of contracting COVID-19. You're assuming the risk by entering these premises. And the idea is the Georgia legislature decided that instead of facing the onslaught of lawsuits that said, I came in to use, you know, to, to come into your business, I thought you would keep me safe while I was in your business. You didn't. Now I'm going to sue you. Um, the Georgia legislature basically said, we're going to pass a law that says if people take the risk of coming out and coming into your business, then they're assuming that risk. And as long as you aren't being recklessly endangering them, willfully or want wantonly injuring them, as long as you're maintaining a basic duty of care, then there's no liability. So um, this is something you may see in other states. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how this shakes out with some of the lawsuits that I expect will be coming up. So some states may have some laws that will ward off this kind of liability. 
Um, and I don't know what other countries are doing, and you'll have to forgive me. Um, I do only follow the, the U.S. law on this. Um, but I'd be interested to, to know if anybody does uh, know of anything, please, by all means, email me. Um, there are some, like I said, this is one of those unusual situations where I am seeing some language um, that is being put into um, contracts specific to COVID-19, and that's not very common. Um, but it's specific things around, for example, space issues. Um, you know, we used to say that any meeting that was a space hog was a, was a bad thing. You know, if you needed a lot of meeting space and not too many sleeping rooms, you were not a very good meeting, right? Because nobody wants that. Well, with social distancing now, we were exactly that, right? I need, I need this many rooms, but in order to social distance, I need twice as much meeting space as I did before. Um, so it, that may be a clause that you need to add to your contract or a way that you need to modify your space, um, function space section of your contract. Um, you know, how much space do you need, uh, with social distancing? Is there going to be an additional charge because you need that much more space, um, that you don't want to have to share pre-function space with other groups, uh, to minimize the risk. Okay. Your group is taking the risk that it will be with, you know, with their, their same group. But if they're having to cross paths with various other groups in the pre-function area, or um, if they're doing some type of complete meeting package, if they're having to share break areas with other people in a conference center, uh, of course, the risk just goes up and up and up. So in order to reduce that risk, um, spelling out these things in function space. And if you do need now twice the space, is there an additional fee for that? Is there an additional fee for having to turn now twice as much space? Uh, whereas before the turns, if they were over a reasonable amount of time, uh, if you were ch you know, changing it from, from classroom style to banquet, uh, there was no charge. Is there a charge now? Uh, what do we mean in terms of how many people can sit at a round? You would not believe some of the things I've heard um, in terms of the set. I have not yet heard standards, um, although I understand the Events Industry Council is working on standards for what should be socially uh, social distance acceptable for how many people should be seated at a 72 inch round. Um, you know, that's a, you know, if you've got a 60 inch round, if you've got a 72 inch round, you put one person at that round, um, you know, how do you do that? Um, so spelling all of those things out in the contract is now very important. Um, servicing requirements, you know, do you, do you want, may you have the same staff people so that you're not, again, increasing your risk by having different staff people servicing your meeting? Um, you know, if you've got the same people, again, your risk is that those same people, you know, coming in and out are the same people. If you have a different set of wait staff, banquet staff, um, you know, kitchen staff, all of that, they all bring exponentially the people that they've been exposed to. Is that something you want to put in your contract? Is that important to you? Is that even possible with work hours, with breaks needed, with holiday, you know, with the people taking their holidays and their vacate, their, their time off? Um, you know, how many staff will be serv serving the meetings? Um, what's the facility's policy on mask wearing? Uh, can you count on that? Is that going to be consistent? Um, and, you know, again, mask wearing, you see less consistent. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I see people wearing wearing masks, but wearing them under their nose, right? Or folding them up so much above their chin that you know, they may as well not be wearing something over their, their mouth. Um, so being real clear on those kinds of things and what's important to your people. Will your, will your people be wearing masks if they're your attendees? Um, and what does that mean at banquets? Do they wear them until they're seated at the table? Um, that kind of thing. Um, available services and amenities at the time of the meeting. This is something I'm not seeing in contracts, and I think it needs to be spelled out. If your expectation is... Um, and it's important enough, let's say you have an incentive group or you have a VIP group and it's important to them that the golf course is available or that the spa services are available. Well, most spa services are not available in hotels and resorts right now. So spell that out in the contract. They will be available or if they're not available, the resort will inform you X weeks ahead of time. And then what? You know, you always have to say, and then what? 
there's a reduction in the room rate, or you can terminate without liability, or you're going to get a contract to, um, you know, you're going to get a discount on the room rate and you're going to use a outside spa and the hotel's going to help provide transportation. What? You've got you to have a what there. Um, and then the cleaning and sanitation standards to be met. And I like to use um, the word warrant. So the hotel warrants that it will meet or exceed the cleaning and sanitation standards as follows, and then specify exactly what cleaning and sanitation standards those are. So for example, um, you know, lots of different hotels have rolled out different branded cleaning and sanitation standards. Who knew cleaning was going to be what differentiated different hotels, right? So Marriott rolled out its plan. Um, this was back in April, you know, became their, their branded plan. Uh, Wynn in Las, the Wynn in Las Vegas, um, you know, rolled out their, uh, I think it was a 20 point plan for exactly how they were going to clean um, and sanitize and whatnot. Um, I personally am kind of a fan of anything that follows, um, you know, like the American Hotel and Lodging Association came out with their safe stay guidelines. Um, because one of the complaints by meeting planners was, well, everybody's got their own plan. We don't know how alike or different they are. We don't know which ones are good or not good or, or good enough. And some are endorsed by products. So this one's a Lysol, um, you know, Lysol endorsed cleaning program. This one's Clorox endorsed, you know, Procter and Gam Gamble endorses this one. But what does that mean? Um, so, you know, this one, the American Hotel and Lodging Association came up with this. So maybe you want to put in your contract, the hotel warrants that it's cleaning and sanitation uh, program will meet or exceed the safe stay guidelines established by the American Hotel and Lodging Association. So that means that you've got a baseline, right? It may or may not be the best, but you've got a baseline to compare it by so that if there is some type of COVID issue, or let's say there's a terrible outbreak and a lot of people get sick, um, you can go back and compare what they've done to what's in these safe stay guidelines. So at least it gives you a baseline to look at it. And it's not like you'll keep it real clean. That's vague. That's ambiguous. Safe stay guidelines gives you something to look at. Um, I'm also very intrigued by the GBAC star accreditation for venues. I can't claim to know a whole lot about it, but I do like that they have this 20 step performance based program. Um, you know, and that there are a number of different uh, facilities that um, a lot of convention centers that are getting this certification. Again, cleaning sanitation is now a, a marketing tool. Um, so, and if I were an organization trying to prove that I'm meeting my duty of care, uh, choosing, a, an orga choosing a facility that is actually certified um, over one that's not certainly shows that I'm doing my due diligence. Uh, certainly shows that I'm doing my duty of care. So from a legal standpoint, it looks good for you. Um, and from a legal standpoint, it looks good for these that are getting the certification. Again, I don't know much about GBAC star certification or accreditation, uh, but I can tell you those kinds of things play well um, in a legal sense. So in terms of, um, you know, what we can do with our meetings, we know we can pivot, we can change the nature of our events, we can postpone them, we can cancel them. Um, I sort of was amused that this one conference just changed its name to pivot and indeed did pivot. Um, we know that, you know, some of our big industry organization meetings changed. Um, the American Society of Association Executives uh, canceled their meeting. We know Meeting Professionals International um, is uh, they first postponed it. They, they postponed their meeting um, and it's now going to be sort of a hybrid mix of digital and live. Um, if you are going to have to postpone a meeting, uh, put it in writing, make sure you agree on everything and put all those changes in writing. Um, I saw a lot of the initial postponements kind of done on a handshake. And that's never a great idea because you just don't know, again, a lot of people lost their jobs or were furloughed. Um, and now that things are back to, people are getting back to these things, sometimes the original people who agreed to the postponement are gone. And it's a little hard to, uh, to know what the details are supposed to be. 
Um, and then make sure that you just, you, you know what you're going to have to pay for with the postponement and that kind of thing. Um, the World Health Organization has an event risk assessment, which I think is really great. It gives you some specifications for, you know, assessing your risk in terms of um, these areas, uh, you know, how intense the COVID is where you are, the characteristics of your event, et cetera. Um, and then they, uh, their last points were assign num numerical scores to the risk factors. Um, and they didn't have an example of that. So I created one just as an example. This is purely mine, um, uh, but I thought it would be an idea of how to determine whether to cancel or maybe postpone your, your meeting or your event. Um, if you look at the risk factors here, uh, is it indoors? Is it youth? Is there a lot of interaction? Assigning that a risk factor number and then the control factors, the good things. You know, we have limited attendance, hand sanitizers, you know, and then sort of subtracting these, uh, this from this to figure out which are your low and high and medium risk, just to give yourself an idea. Like if this were my event, would it be worth postponing? Could, should we go on with it? Should we cancel it? So it's just something for you to look at to, to so you might want to try this to sort of give yourself an idea or to help your decision makers make decisions. Um, if you are looking at, we know that early on, even as far as March, we had people, just about everybody that MPI surveyed said they were canceling and they weren't just canceling one or two, but up to 25 meetings, uh, 25 or more meetings, uh, some of them. So we know that cancellation is voluntary and people have to pay damages. Uh, force majeure means it self-destructs. So let's talk a little bit about those two different clauses because they look very different in contracts. This is not a sample clause. This is just sort of what it says. But basically the cancellation clause says um, the contract binds the parties. And if one party chooses not to be bound by it, even though that's what the contract does, then they're going to pay damages, monetary damages to the other party and then they figure out how those damages are going to be calculated. Um, and then once the damages are paid, then the parties walk away. So that's cancellation. Um, and then force majeure on the other hand, and I did draft this language, um, including this language about, and this is language I might consider adding in for COVID. Um, you know, we usually throw in the kitchen sink here with things like, um, you know, confirmed disease outbreak and that kind of thing. You might for COVID add in something like uh, as evidenced by Center for Disease Control Warning Level 3. Um, that gives you something firm to hold on to about COVID. As an example, this is Warning Level 3. This is just recent. You can see these are some countries, and I don't mean to pick on any particular countries, where they're saying uh, all non-essential travel is, is not recommended to these countries. So that would give you a very firm force majeure out. Uh, other things like the city or the state saying no public gatherings is also firm force majeure. Everything else is a little gray. Uh, fear of, of COVID-19 is not a force majeure. So without some of these other things, without something a little more firm than just people are afraid to travel there, you don't really have a solid force majeure. Um, so, so you've got to have something a little stronger, which is why I gave you the language, the suggestion of tying it to CDC or something like that. Um, and then some, you know, uh, the other thing I might consider is having your force majeure clause have, um, you know, some time frame because we don't know. A lot of people don't know. Uh, you may need some time to cancel or move your meeting. So maybe looking at it 12 weeks out, um, you know, be, can we terminate it up to 12 weeks out so we have time to move it to a different place that's not COVID affected, or we have time to, um, you know, to, to let our people know or make changes or whatever. Um, so that's another suggestion that you might have, that I might make um, in terms of changing your force majeure clause. Um, so the, also there's sometimes in force majeure clauses, a notify to intent, uh, you have to in, notify them within 10 days of a force majeure event. Well, COVID has been here for a while, so you can't do that. Um, so that's just something to consider. Um, 
Event cancellation insurance is uh, something to consider. It goes along with force majeure, um, but I can tell you COVID's not going to be covered. These are a few COVID uh, resources you might want to consider um, if they're of interest to you. And that is all I have. I hope that was helpful to you all. Thank you very much. What a fantastic presentation. Some great actionable takeaways for us all there. Um, and thank you so much for attending this session. Thank you to you, Tyra, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of Planet IMX. Bye from us.